All right. So here's what we want to start with, okay? So here are, your, here are going to be your questions we're going to be looking at, okay? So just kind of go over them before we start the story. Blank, blank, come on, there we go. All right. Shh. First one's how is hell arranged in this epic poem? We kind of already know that. You've got the different layers based on which sins you fall into, and they're in increasing magnitude. Okay, the ones at the top are still punishment, but they're not near as bad as the ones you get down to near at the bottom, okay? Um, it says, how has this impacted the way people tend to view hell today? You know, we rank sins still today. You know, and those are the, you know, like I said, we've got the seven deadly sins kind of organized. Now, there's nine layers. So, like, anger and um, violence are, are both coins that deal with wrath. You know, of course, and then there's fraud and treachery. Those are all, they're going to be, they're not word for word, but, you know, they're close. You can make them fit. Number two says, what's different about Satan and his place in hell? Which you could already answer, but we're going to actually see him in a minute, so don't worry about that. We'll get to it. What is Satan doing at the center of hell, and what does this reflect about how most people of Dante's day might view sin? You know, if I was to ask you right now, and guys, I debated doing this, and I was like, no, this is going to open a whole can of, I'm going to end up in the office, all right? But if we were to look today and rank sins based on what we think is worse, you know, I debated, and I've worked with a friend, and we'd never finish it, and I don't think we ever will, working on making a more modern version of this. And you think about how today we wouldn't rank sin the same way he did. I mean, treachery is at the bottom. Y'all stab each other in the back like it's nobody's business. So, um, and we see that constantly. All right? It, it's almost seen as whatever. All right? You know, we would have this arranged very dip differently, to be honest with you. Um, so, uh, so we're going to look at what that, this says about their viewpoint at that time. And we can even talk about why that changed today, which just a heads up, you may see that on the test. Okay, why our views of like treachery are not the same as they were then. Um, four, what physical description of Satan is provided in this excerpt? Does this meet with how you envision the devil? And it's not going to, all right? You know, our vision of the devil, a little, you know, the horns, the pitchfork, the pointy tail, that's not what we have here. This guy has three heads. Um, is completely moral. Like, he's not doing anything. He's trapped in hell. He doesn't come out. He's frozen in the center of hell. You know, hell's supposed to be hot and not where Satan is. Satan's part is freezing. And he's got three heads and he's just chewing on three people. We, they said who the three were. Did you hear who they were? Three. Cassius, Judas, and Cassius was the other one. So you got the two from Julius Caesar, which we read in 10th grade. And then you've got Judas. And we'll talk about them when we get to them, okay? Um, it says, what is symbolic about the speaker and his guide having to climb down? Satan's at the center of this cosmic thing. So they'll start by climbing down his back, and then at some point they have to turn around and climb up the back of his legs. Because it'd be like if you were dr if you could go through the center of the earth. At some point you would be going down, and then all of a sudden you'd be going up. It, it's weird to think about, but that's how that would work. Um, and so, so what's symbolic about that? And again, we'll talk about it a little bit when we get there, but I do want you to do some of your own thinking. I don't want you just to repeat what I say because that's hurting some of you on the tests. Okay, it's not just let me copy something directly from the book or just write down what Mr. Moore said. There is a level of I'm trying to make you think on your own and make some of your own connections. And then finally, six, it says, are stories like this in Paradise Lost good for people to analyze the concept of sin and hell or do they just make things more confusing? Again, you're welcome to your opinion. I have a very strong one about this, but you don't have to agree with me. Okay, again, this is about you thinking for yourself. So here we go. We're going to look on page 542. And this is interesting. Paradise Lost does this too. Um, it kind of gives you a prose version, and then it puts the poetry there too. Because the guys, that, both Dante and uh, Milton, who wrote after this, Paradise Lost is centuries older than this. I mean, centuries came centuries later. Uh, that means Dante's Inferno is older. But um, they both would give you like a summary at the beginning and then the actual story afterwards because they wanted you to understand it. It's not just about, hey, here's some fancy poetry. It's not John Donne writing his fancy poems so that Carly's confused. And it's like, what is this about? That's not the point here. They really want you to get it. All right. They also want to show off, hey, look how smart I am. But if you're not smart enough to get it, here's a simpler version. Okay. All right, so let's look at the background first on 543. It says, in his Divine Comedy, Dante uses an organizing principle based on the number three, drawn from the Christian concept of the Holy Trinity. Documenting his imagined visit to hell, purgatory, and heaven, he divides the epic into three parts, Inferno, Purgatorio, and Paradiso. In Paradise, Dante will be guided by his beloved Beatrice. For his trip through hell to purgatory, however, Dante's guide is the poet Virgil, to whom Dante pays homage by calling him my master. 
Virgil takes Dante through the nine circles of hell, organized by gravity of the sin involved. In this final canto inferno, the two reach the ninth circle, by the frozen waters of Cossetus, where those guilty of the worst sin, treachery, are found. They include Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, and Brutus and Cassius, two Roman senators who plotted to assassinate the Roman leader, Julius Caesar. They also include the angel-turned-devil Satan, here called Lucifer, the ultimate traitor who rebelled against God. So it's fitting that Satan's at the center, because his big sin was treachery as well. Now, it's interesting because he pay, takes a religious figure, Judas, and classical myth figures like Judas, I'm uh, not Judas, uh, Cassius and Brutus. He puts them there, uh, and it's just those three at the very bottom of hell. Well, four if you count Satan. All right? Okay, so um, let's begin here. And again, the first one, two, three, four paragraphs here kind of give you the setup for this. And then we're going to read the poetry version. So you'll know ahead of time, but we're still going to read the poetry too because you need to be exposed to that too. Is Bella ever going to really need to know how this works, what ter tercerima is? No, but it's still okay to be exposed to stuff. You're never going to need to know who won the 2021 football championship either, but y'all all watch that so super carefully. So that's not going to matter either in your future. So let's not make that mistake. Of, what do we have to do? This isn't going to matter. If all we did was stuff that mattered, we spent spend a lot of time learning how your car works, and some of you learn how a mop works and things like that, okay? So being exposed to stuff just for the sake of being exposed is also part of it, all right? Okay, he says, On March the Banners of the King, Virgil begins as the poets face the last depth. He is quoting a medieval hymn, and to it he adds the distortion and perversion of all that lies about him. On March the Banners of the King of Hell. And there before him, in an infernal parody of the Godhead, they see Satan in the distance, his great wings beating like a windmill. It is their beating that is the source of the key wind, I'm sorry, yeah, the, the icy, sorry, the icy wind of Cossetus, the exhalation of all evil. You know, they talked about the number three being key. There's a hundred cantos, if I remember right, in all three books. So there's 33 in each of them, except one has 34. I forget which one has the additional one. It may be the last one. All right? So, but then even Satan's got how many heads? Did I tell you? Three, and that's meant to parody the Trinity. All right? So the number three is huge in the Bible. It's a, ma it's a number, like three in, in uh, multiples of three. Like there's 12 disciples. You know, three is a big number. And so um, Dante takes that number and uses it in this as well. This is all about him, and the ice are strewn the centers of the last round, Judeca, named after Judas Iscariot. These are the treacherous to their masters. They lie completely sealed in the ice, twisted and distorted into every conceivable posture. It is impossible to speak to them, and the poets move on to observe Satan. So this last level actually doesn't just have those three guys in it. They're just the worst offenders. The rest of them are frozen in ice in, in really uncomfortable positions, and they can't move. Think about how miserable that would be. All right, and y'all aren't crying because it's 40 degrees outside, and y'all walk in here and, like, look, well, you've about been out snow skiing, Okay. And you act like you're dying just from walking from your car to in here. Imagine actually being frozen in ice for all of eternity. And not only frozen in ice, but in a really uncomfortable position where you can't get any relief. Okay, and again, the concept of eternity is too big for us to really picture. But again, the 30 seconds it takes or minutes, depending on if you're fat like me, however long it takes you to walk from your car to in here, you're, some of you walk in that door looking like you, you think you're dead. I mean, in, in, imagine this is... Billions of times worse. Billions of times. Uh, he says, He is fixed into the ice at the center to which flow all the rivers of guilt. And as he beats his great wings as if to escape, the icy wind only freezes him more surely into the polluted ice. In a grotesque parody of the Trinity, he has three faces, each a different color, and in each mouth he clamps a sinner whom he rips eternally with his teeth. Judas Iscariot is in the central mouth, Brutus and Cassius in the mouths on either side. Having seen all, the poets now climb through the center, grappling hand over hand down the hairy flank of Satan himself, a last supremely symbolic action. And at last, when they have passed the Earth's center, uh, when, sorry, when they pass the center of all gravity, they emerge from hell. A long climb from the Earth's center to the Mount of Purgatory awaits them, and they push on without rest, ascending along the sides of the river Lethe till they emerge once more to see the stars of heaven just before dawn on Easter Sunday. All right. So we're going to talk about when we get to it, but why it's significant that they have to climb Satan to get away from this and get to purgatory. Now, purgatory, again, may be a concept you're not familiar with in the Protestant church. You might know what purgatory is. It's like Yeah. What were you going to say, Will? Something about how it's waiting. Yeah. Basically, the way it was seen is if you died and, you know, you, you 
still had sin on your soul, this is where you would like kind of wait it out and pay, you know, until you could finally go into heaven. All right. Yeah, there's several different denominations that, that do that. It's not just the Catholics. Uh, you, and it's not technically called purgatory, but there's other, n not Protestant-based, but there's some other groups that do the same thing. Uh, you know, the idea here was, and it was, you would pay some monks, and they would say some prayers and do stuff, you know, and it would lessen your time in purgatory, and you could get out yeah. sooner. Yeah, learned about that in Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, that was a thing. Um, so, biblically, in like the typical Protestant Bible, there's no references to purgatory, okay? So, that's why we don't go with that. And there's no real references to a period in there. Um, so, but uh, that is, Madison's hitting on something that I definitely don't want to wander down too much. But, yeah, it does seem almost, you know, designed for that purpose really well. Um, but that's the next set book. There's three books. Inferno just covers the trip through hell. I mean, I can't imagine you're not, what you're going to do in purgatory. I mean, that, that we're more interested in that kind of stuff. If we were like, here's a book on a bunch of angels, and here's a book on, you know, on like names and like different traits of demons, more people are going to pick the demon book than the angel book. It's weird. You know, you're like, let's talk about what heaven looks like versus what hell looks like. More people are going to be interested in hell than heaven. I mean, not going there. But if you're going to read about it, you're like, oh, yeah, heaven, I know, clouds, harps, got it. Uh, hell, let's read about that. I mean, it's just weird how that's what we gravitate to. That's why Inferno, big seller. The other two, I mean, you, you know, a lot of people don't even know there were two more books. They're all together called the Divine Comedy. Now, people look at it like it's not funny. Why do they call it comedy? Do you know why they use that term? Because it's not funny. More sales. Do what? People will buy it more. Uh -huh. Well, because of our misunderstanding of the term comedy. Yeah, wasn't, didn't comedy mean something different back Yeah. Then? Comedy doesn't mean ha-ha funny in this time period. Comedy means the, per, the protagonist is in a better place at the end. So he starts in hell and ends up in heaven. That's about as comedy as it gets if that's your definition. All right? If it was the other way around, we would call it a tragedy because he's in worse shape than when it started. That's really the def difference in those two terms. You know, in theater, you know, your comedy and tragedy masks, that's really the two types of... There's, like, these other you can, histories and other things you can say as different types, but really you've got two types of writing. You've got tragedy and you've got comedy. In tragedy, something bad happens to the main character, and at the end of it, they're in worse shape than when they started. Typically, they're dead. All right? But comedy, on the other hand, something good happens. The bad stuff may happen on the way. That's what conflict is about. But at the end, they're in a better place than when it started. Those are just your two defining factors of these. So the divine comedy doesn't mean, ha-ha, this is really funny. It means that Dante, who is the, the writer and the main character, he wrote it as, I'm the star of this book, is actually in a better place at the end. All right, does that make sense? All right, let's read the actual poetry part. Now, again, this is, a, I don't know if your book defines this. Let me look real quick, because uh, if so, I can point you to it. No, it just talks about epics, so no big deal. Um, but this is a specific, like, iambic pentameter is what most people study, at least in high school. They tell you it's, a, it's the stressed, unstressed, or unstressed, stressed. I forget the order. But an iambic pentameter, there's five sets of those in a line. Sometimes you play with it, you break it. This is a different type of writing. I'm not going to make you memorize or anything, but Dante invented this particular meter just for this book. All right, so that's pretty impressive. All right, he says, On march the banners of the king of hell, my master said, Toward us, look straight ahead. Can you make him out at the core of the frozen shell, like a whirling windmill seen afar at twilight? Or when a mist has risen from the ground, just such an engine rose upon my sight, stirring up such a wild and bitter wind, I cowered for shelter at my master's back. Now, I know I, my uh, professor who taught this in school is trying to show us how this particular rhythm works, but here's the problem. Why do you think the rhythm doesn't always work when we read it in English? Because it was written in a different language. It was originally written in a different language. And they're just, just translating stuff to make the rhythm fit, you've got to be an expert. <laughs> I mean, because you're going to have to play with the wording and everything else to try to get the same idea, but make it fit. It was originally written in Italian. Italian and English aren't the same language, all right? They have very different rhythms. So if it doesn't, if you're listening like this, doesn't feel like there's a rhythm to it. Well, there's a reason for that, okay? All right. Uh, I cowered for shelter at my master's back, there being no other windbreak I could find. I stood now where the souls of the last class, with fear, my verses tell it, were covered wholly. They shone below the ice like straws in glass. Some lie stretched out, others are fixed in place, upright. Some on their heads, some on their souls. Another, like a, a bow, 
a you know, bow bends foot to face. Imagine that's how you spend eternity. You know, rolled up where your, your feet are like rubbed up in your face. And that's how you're going to spend the rest of your time for eternity. Um, it says, when we had gone so far across the ice that it pleased my God to show me the foul creature which once had worn the grace of paradise, he made me stop. And stepping aside, he answered, now see the face of Dis. This is the place where you must arm your soul against all dread. In the journey through hell, the, the outer few layers are kind of outside of hell proper. There's a whole wall, and you get into the city that's called Dis, D-I-S, and that's where all of these people are. So that, you know, again, even the people in hell, you're in hell, but there's certain parts of it that are better than others. And once you're inside the walls, and you can see it in that picture uh, at the top of 545, if you look really close, right about the middle, it's like the Great Wall of China right across the middle of it there. That's that wall that separates the really bad sinners from the, well, still bad. Okay, uh, this is the place where you must arm your soul against all dread. Do not ask, reader, how my blood ran cold and my voice choked up with fear. I cannot write it. This is a terror that cannot be told. I did not die, and yet I lost life's breath. Imagine for yourself what I became, deprived at once of both my life and death. The emperor of the universe of pain jutted his upper chest above the ice, and I am closer in size to the great mountain the titans make around the central pit than did they to his arms. So he's pointing out, he's like, I don't think I can even describe how scary Satan is. But he points out he's massive. He's just this huge being. Which, that, that's, a, that's a similarity with Paradise Lost. Satan was huge there, too. But you don't typically think about, like, if you were trying to describe how scary something is, that it's like, you know, you know, little little midget Satan. That's not scary. I mean, you know, still pretty evil, but I mean, telling you, when you if he's huge and massive, that's much scarier. Um, now, starting from this part, imagine the hole that corresponds to it. If he was once as beautiful as now, he is hideous and still turned on his maker. He, well, may he be the source of every woe. With what a sense of awe I saw his head towering above me, for it had three faces. One was in front, and it was fiery red. The other two, as weirdly wonderful, merged with it from the middle of each shoulder to the point where all converged at the top of the skull. The right was something between white and bile. The left was about the color one observes on those who live along the banks of the Nile. What color do you think that is? Green, yeah, good. So the, the Nile River is not like a very clear, pretty river, okay? So it's like, you know, you've got the center one's red, then you've got this kind of white, sickly-looking one, and then a green, sickly-looking one on the other side. So even the, the image we saw in the video is not right. What were you going to say? Yeah, yeah, I'd say that's a good color for it. If not, a little greener, but yeah. Um, all right, Will, where was I? Under each head. Thanks. Under each head, two wings rose terribly. Their span proportioned to so gross a bird. I never saw such sails upon the sea. They were not feathers. Their texture and their form were like bats' wings. You know, that's also an important distinction. When you think about, about angels, you think kind of like wings with feathers, kind of, because it's a prettier image. You know, like with birds, bird wings are pretty. Bat wings are, mm, those are gross. Those are creepy, okay? Again, we have to think about it within the context of what seems scarier. And he beat them so that the three winds blew from him in one great storm, is that these winds that freeze all of Cossetus. He swept from his six eyes and down three chins the tears ran, mixed with bloody froth and pus. In every mouth he worked a broken center between his rake-like teeth. Isn't that disgusting? And then all of a sudden it's a sad detail. I'm like, oh, I mean, it's still the devil, but, you know, he's crying the whole time. That's still kind of sad. Maybe none of y'all think it is. I think it's sad, all right? It says, thus he kept three in eternal pain as his, at his eternal dinner. For the one in front, the biting seemed to play no part at all compared to the ripping. At times, the whole skin of his back was flayed away. That soul that suffers most, explained my guide, is Judas Iscariot, he who kicks his legs on the fiery chin and has his head inside. Of the other two who have their heads thrust forward, the one who dangles down from the black face is Brutus. Note how he writhes without a word, and there with the huge and sinewy arms is the soul of Cassius. But the night is coming on, and we must go, for we have seen the whole. So he points out that, you know, Judas is different. Judas's head is inside of Satan's mouth, so he's not seeing anything but constantly being eaten. The other two are at least with their heads out. They're still seeing something else. So even those three aren't being punished equally. Judas is getting the worst of it, which that's what you would expect. Okay, I mean, that's, that's how you would definitely expect this. Um... 
Okay, he says, but uh, we must go, for we have seen the whole. He's talking about the whole of hell. They've seen it all. He says, now it's time to leave. Then as he bayed, I clasped his neck, and he, watching for a moment where the wings were open wide, reached over dexterously and seized the shaggy coat of the king demon. Then grappling matted hair and frozen uh, crusts from one tuft to another, clambered down. When we had reached the joint where the great thigh merges into the swelling of the haunch, my guide and master, straining terribly, turned his head to where his feet had been and began to grip the hair as if he were climbing, so that I thought we moved toward hell again. Hold fast, my guide said, and his breath came shrill with labor and exhaustion. There is no way but by such stairs to rise above such evil. For the question about what's symbolic about it, that's going to be the line you want. All right. The idea here is the only way to get get past sin and evil is to climb over it you know to deal with it that sort of thing okay now you're gonna have to expand on that don't write me just to climb over it and get over it those are that's how you're losing points okay you know, you're gonna have to do a little better than that it says at last he climbed out through an opening in the central rock where and he seated me on the rim then joined me with a nimble backward spring i looked up thinking to see lucifer as i had left him and i saw instead his legs projecting high into the air now let all those whose dull minds are still vexed by failure to understand what point it was I had passed through judge if I was perplexed. Get up, up on your feet, my master said. The sun already mounts to middle tiers, and a, king, a long road and hard climbing lie ahead. It was no hail of state we had found there, but a natural animal pit hollowed from rock with a broken floor and a close and sunless air. Before I tear myself from the abyss, I said when I had risen, Oh, my master, explain to me my error in all this. Where's the ice and Lucifer? How has he been turned from top to bottom, and how can the sun have gone from the night to day so suddenly? And he to me, you imagine you were still on the other side of the center, where I grasped the shaggy flank of the great worm of evil, which bores through the world. You were while I climbed down, but when I turned myself about, you passed the point to which all gravity is drawn. You are under the other hemisphere where you stand. The sky above us is the half opposed to that which canopies the great dry land. Uh, so where is hell in Dante's... You know his his cosmos here. This floor. Yeah, it's the center of Earth. That's how he's got it designed. You know, be like again if you went through the center of the Earth and then you tried to climb back out. At some point, gravity would you know sh shift up. I guess. I mean, obviously you can't do this, but it's just theoretical here. So he, he they described it in the video that it's where Satan was cast into hell. He actually like hit the Earth in this big pit and he went straight to the middle. Is how Dante's visioning it. Um. Under the midpoint of the other sky, the man who was born sinless and who lived beyond all blemish came to suffer and die. You have your feet upon a little sphere which forms the other face of the Judeca. There it is evening when it was morning here. And this gross fiend, an image of all evil, who made a stairway for us with his hide, is pinched and prisoned in the ice pack still. On this side he plunged down from heaven's height, and the land that spread here once hid in the sea and fled north to our hemisphere for fright. And it may be that moved at the same fear, this one peak that still rises from this side uh, fled upward, leaving this great cavern here. Down there, beginning at the further bound of Beelzebub's dim tomb. Now, this is where Beelzebub is still the devil. You know, in Paradise Lost, there are two different demons. This one, they're using it interchangeably, I believe. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's how they're using it here. There's a space not known by sight, but only by the sound of a little stream descending through the hollow it has eroded from the massive stone in its endlessly entwining lazy flow. My guide and I crossed over and began to mount that little known and lightless road to ascend into the shining world again. He first, I second, without thought of rest. We climbed the dark until we reached the point where a round opening brought in, in sight the blessed and beauteous shining of the heavenly cars, and we walked out once more beneath the stars. They find the spot where they were like when Satan landed, he actually landed on this side, face first, and dove in just into the ground. And they said on this side, all the oceans fled to the north, and these mountains fled, trying to get away from him up. And that's where they find themselves. The mountain they're going to climb next is going to be purgatory until they get to the top of it, and then they're going to get into heaven. And he's going to get to see heaven at that point. And they also are divided. So there's all not 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 nearly as interesting as this, sadly, but they have that too. So used to be when I used to teach this go back about five, six, seven years when the PlayStation 3 was around, there's a game called Dante's Inferno where you go through the different levels of hell. The kids all knew exactly what it is. Really violent? Not so close to the uh, actual book, but the concept is is uh, somewhat similar. So, you know, if you're uh, bored and all of a sudden you might, that pops into your head, you can look at it. It's pretty interesting the way they set it up. In that one, Dante's this, this like, 
soldier like in Castlevania that's trying to kill all these demons. And it's a really interesting setup. All right, well, that'll get us through this. Uh, perfect timing. So tomorrow, I'm not sure what tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow's some poetry. Going to be very quick, all right? So you'll have some time to work on questions.